What's going on, guys? Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and we're here to kick off your week with a brand new top 10 back issues for you to be on the lookout for, right? That's right. This is not the reactive list. This is not the hot list. These are 10 books that we believe are going to be spiking in the near to long-term future. These are books that are available now. These are books you should be being on the lookout for right now with an eye to the future. Right. We're not putting books on here that have peaked that on everyone else's hot 10, top 10 list. So people can take poke holes at them and they go, huh, huh, it's only going for 20 bucks. That's the whole point. It's on the list for, and we think it presents great buying opportunity. And that's what our top 10 list consists of every week to create that overarching big master list. But we're going to get into the first one, starting with number 10. And penetrating the list at that bottom spot in number 10, we get that Star Wars number 43, Volume one has a pretty good first appearance in here, right? That's right. We're talking about Lando Calrissian. And now we've talked on this channel on several programs about our belief that really Star Wars keys are undervalued. Now, certainly we are no longer preaching to an empty church with this one because everybody is talking Star Wars keys. But there are still some classic first appearances from that first series that are just kind of overlooked. And Lando is one of them. But Lando's back in the news with reports that Donald Glover is going to be reprising his role as Lando Calrissian for an upcoming Disney Plus series. And that is going to get a lot of attention on Lando in a way that we haven't seen. Because if you're judging anything by that Mandalorian heat, I would expect to see that show be extremely popular and the character increase his visibility and storytelling ability. So this is a, a issue that seems like a no-brainer, but one that's often overlooked and is still quite affordable. Yeah, whether it's Billy D. Williams, whether it's Donald Glover. Another thing also is a lot of people gave some hate on that solo movie. I actually really enjoyed that movie. So if you haven't watched it, you have Disney Plus. It's up there available for you to watch now for free. Well, minus your subscription for Disney Plus. But I thought it was a really great, great movie. And Jack, I think you've said similar. Yeah, I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was just fun. I think that's the best way to describe it, which is why I'm real bullish on Lando as a comic property. Coming at the number nine spot. This is one that's kind of niche. A lot of collectors like to pick up these type stories, but it's also something to be aware of. And we're talking about the Strange Academy previews. We're talking about that Strange Academy preview that appeared in multiple Marvel issues, right? Yeah, and it's funny that it is even considered niche, Brian, because if you look at like the Teen Titans characters like Cyborg um, and Raven, who were first featured in DC Presents 26, it's a preview exactly the same manner as this Strange Academy preview. I think really the only difference is that it only existed in one book versus this one existing in, I think, five or six. So either way, we've seen the heat on Strange Academy 1. It's a major key. Book is on fire. Late printings are on fire. Issue 2 is on fire. There's so much reader buzz and heat coming for Issue 3. It's something that we have to take note of, but there's a lot of readily available under market really true first appearances that may one day be looked at as a first appearance of these characters available on the market. So the toughest one is Thor 2. Obviously, that's already a hot book because of the Black Winter cameo, as well as the DC Marvel crossover tease that Donny Cates threw in there. But there are some other ones to pay attention to. Doctor Strange number three, Miles Morales, Spider-Man 15, um, Ruins of Ravencroft number one, and my favorite, Daredevil 17, because I believe that that is probably the lowest printed of the group um, and is already a reader buzz book. So you're already seeing some prices on this book above $10. Um, I think that's something to pay attention to and something to be on the lookout for. But if you see any of these issues on your retail shelf for cover price, I would grab them. Coming in next on the list at number eight, we get that Raphael number one, that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. But we're talking about that second print. Yeah, the, really the second print is an interesting um, case because it sells for about $30. And the first print is an on-fire book that sells for like $150 to $200. And there's a, a great disparity between the first and second print. Um, now, obviously, there's a great print run disparity. Um, there's certainly a time factor, the second print coming well later. But second print, color cover, very cool cover. Um, definitely a cover that you wouldn't see from Ninja Turtles today when you start talking about like the machine guns on the cover. But here's the thing. This is also the first appearance of Casey Jones. And 
I think that's going to become more and more important with the current Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles run by Sophie Campbell. Now, we've talked about how bullish we are on that. And everybody loves Jenica, right? Everybody loves her first appearance, and everybody was talking about it. But you know what they don't do, Brian? They don't read the comics. And if you read the comics, you know that Jenica's love interest is Casey Jones. But, of course, Jenica turned into a turtle when this happened. This was difficult for Casey Jones to deal with. Imagine your wife turning into a turtle. What would you do? So, like a lot of men, he flee. And we have not seen Casey Jones for a number of issues, but it's inevitable he's coming back. And he, how he deals with this is going to be a central storyline in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as his absence has certainly been something that has been affecting Jenica. So because of that, I think we're going to be talking Casey Jones in the coming months to years. And this first appearance is much more of an affordable key than that first print. And again, that's the purpose of this show is to give you guys a look at some books that you may not be looking at today. Yeah, a lot of people like that first print cover and it's iconic, but I think they look at it because of that being an iconic. If I were to put them up side by side right now without knowing the history of them, I actually like that second print cover better anyways. Me too. Yeah, the color, the vibrance. Next on the list, we have Thor number one. Now, if you watch this channel, you will know I was a huge Jason Aaron Thor fan. I knew Donny Cates writes good stories, but I was still trepidatious about it because we always brought that up. I was like, hey, how am I going to feel about this? And I've been enjoying this run just as much as that Jason Aaron run. But Thor number one is definitely one to pick up, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we can really talk about this entry as well as our next entry with Venom number one, talking about the Donny Cates run and the number one issue for that run. Because both of these runs have really the same story going on. These are two of the hottest runs in comics, period. Definitely the hottest runs Marvel has. And each individual issue brings more kind of intrigue and demand over what is going to happen with the story. And we're seeing it on two different levels. One in the upper 20s and one just getting started and hitting issue five. And either way, we're seeing that heat and demand on the series as a whole. Issue number one is kind of the issue that tends to avoid that. And why? Why, you may say. Well, nobody would have advised you to ad invest in issue number one, either of these series, because they were so heavily ordered, um, both for retailer exclusives, as well as just every comic shop knew. Donny Cates, Thor, no-brainer. Donny Cates, Venom, no-brainer. So yeah, for a long time, these books were readily available. And much like Donny Cates' Guardians of the Galaxy and Silver Surfer Black, they were often available for cover price or below for a long time after their release. But we are starting to see something that we haven't seen since maybe the days of like Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld in the X-Men uh, kind of universe where there is a writer who is commanding the attention of the entire comic community to the degree that um, Donny Cates is. And I don't think that you can kind of compare anything else going on in modern comics to it. Um, certainly not even the DC Comics heavyweights of James Tynan and Scott Snyder. So with that in mind, I think these number one issues, these are iconic issues, I think, at least in the future. Um, while today we may look at them as five to ten dollar to fifteen dollar books at best, um, these could be the types of keys that our children are chasing. And for that reason, I think this is one to pay attention to and to be on the lookout for. And the best thing is you can still grab these in nine eight condition um, and and do it affordably. Coming at midway on the list at number five, we get that Stormwatch number four. This is the nineteen ninety eight edition, right? Yeah, this is one of, honestly, my favorite books. First off, it's a tough find. Um, I, I think in all of my years of back issue hunting, I've only ever found one that wasn't appropriately priced. When you find it, most of the time people know what it is and it's priced appropriately. I think I've only ever found one cheap that was really flippable. Um, and then the other thing is with that black border, it's, it's a really tough book to find in good condition. So uh, when you find them in the wild, there's a lot of 7.0, 7.5, 8.0s um, out there raw. And that's tough. Um, but this book is, is a two for it. You get more bang for your buck with this one because you're getting two characters. You're getting Apollo and Midnighter who are kind of satires uh, of sorts on Batman and Superman. And if that's all that it was, you can say, well, we've seen that before, right? We've seen the boys. But this is different. 
this is a, a actual LGBTQ story that existed long before that was popular. Um, and this is a, a homosexual couple who also fights crime together. And obviously that complicates things, right? And it's an element, especially um, with Midnighter, where he's like this badass Batman character um, who really breaks stereotypes of what you would think of a gay character. And DC has really wanted to bring these characters into continuity. There's talk about um, a group that they're associated with, the authority um, getting involved with Superman. I think we're going to see that coming soon. And my belief has always been that these characters, Brian, would be extremely popular in publishing, but especially on either the small screen or big screen. I think these are characters really to invest in the future because I think they're made for HBO Max. Then coming at number four, we get a twofer. We're talking about Megaton number three and Savage Dragon number one. That's right, because we're talking about Savage Dragon. Now, in Megaton number three, the interesting thing about this book is the character isn't called Savage Dragon. It's just called the Dragon. So there is argument about whether or not this is a first appearance, but there's no denying when you see the character that this is Eric Larson's Savage Dragon. Now, Eric Larson also was the, the writer and artist of that book, so that's important to note as well. Now, if that's not your flavor, definitely a high-end book, definitely a rare book. Savage Dragon number one from the miniseries, while yes, produced during the glutton of releases that Image Comics dropped on the world is an absolute classic. And Savage Dragon's a series that cannot be denied. Todd McFarlane gets a lot of credit and a lot of publicity, and deservedly so, for hitting 300 issues of Spawn. But not often talked about enough is the fact that Eric Larson has hit 250 issues on his Savage Dragon title. Now, he said in the past that he's really not interested in any sort of media adaptation of Savage Dragon, but I don't know, Brian, the world is changing. Usagi Yohimbo is coming to Netflix um, as an animated series that you can do so much more with animated properties. CGI has gotten better. So the idea of, say, a live-action Savage Dragon, which at a time would have probably looked hokey, no longer feels like it would look that way. It would look like Power Rangers. <laughs> right. Um, at this point, Savage Dragon um, seems like a character that is edgy and unique. And the story, if you're not familiar with Savage Dragon, I employ you pick up a trade, check it out. I think, you know, it, it, it's a kind of a fresh take on a almost superhero um, style book. But um, it, it's a character that has stood the test of time. And that has to get Hollywood's attention, especially if you see success from Spawn. I don't think that Savage Dragon will be that far behind. Hey, you mentioned Megaton number three. It was just Dragon. Well, that's just because he hadn't gotten Savage yet, right? That didn't right. make out the same person. Right. It's like an Immortal Hulk, Incredible Hulk thing. Yeah. We are now down to the top three. And coming in at number three, we get another Donny Cates book. We're talking about God Country number one. This is one that took off and then kind of came down again, took off again. It kind of has come back down a little bit, but still a great buying opportunity. It's a mini series, but it's a fantastic story. It's one of the ones that kind of put, I want to say put Donny Cates on the map, but got a lot of people interested in. That's right. Now, again, this is a guy who said he's a paid liar. When he finished up God Country, he said, we're done. I'm not doing anything more. And he has recently leaked out that there is a pending announcement coming at any moment that Donny Cates is going to be doing a kind of new mini series in the universe of god country um teaming with a new artist um and but re-entering that world super awesome um i think it's going to get more attention on god country but aside from that we know that donny cates has also penned the script for the upcoming god country feature film and you mentioned that this book has kind of like lost attention it absolutely has it is at that point in the spec cycle that we like to talk about where it's post announcement it's in that low uh, COVID even kicked in and had a little extra effect. Covers A and B are now $30, um, quite frequently $50 for a set or $55. That is criminally low for books that were selling for about $150 for covers A and B. Um, definitely wants to be on the lookout for this. Uh, this series was a success. I imagine any future mini series that Donnie writes is going to be a success. And I definitely think that this one is made for the big screen. Here at number two, we get that Canada team. We're talking about Alpha Flight number one. 
That's right. When you mentioned Team Canada, I'm thinking about the old Bobby Roode, Eric Young TNA days. But no, we're talking about Alpha Flight here with Alpha Flight number one. Now, it's easy to laugh this one off. Um, certainly, a lot of people have for a number of years. But here's the thing. There are very few undervalued Marvel keys that have a potential to be mega keys like kind of property driven keys and it's taken some of these out of left field picks like Shang Chai uh, like the Eternals books that people were not talking about 10 years ago to do that and I think Alpha Flight is one that has that potential now if you follow the the Mikey Sutton um, scoop crew they have certainly been talking about uh, Alpha Flight for a long time. Shout out to Timbo from Lords of the Long Box. And there is a lot of rumor going around that we're going to see Alpha Flight kind of tandem within the debut of Wolverine and that this could spawn into an Alpha Flight miniseries or full length kind of like television series on the Disney Plus network. Now, it's not something that uh, Marvel apparently sees as kind of like its own standalone title, but a Canadian youth-driven uh, superhero team, similar to the X-Men, a little bit different. Someone that no one, people haven't been exposed to other than some like X-Men animated appearances uh, would be uh, a fit for Disney+. Plus. So there, there's a lot of potential here. And you're talking about $20 raw. Um, I find this one in $5 boxes all the time. It, it, this is one that it, it can only stay this cheap for so long. And as soon as there's some like concrete talk, beyond just the rumors and the scoops, then you're going to start to see some serious movement on this. And I wouldn't wait for them. So we're now down to that top spot and coming in at number one this week, we get Astonishing X-Men number 51. This was an issue that got a lot of attention when it came out. And it's still a great book to add to your collection. At no matter, and we still think it's a great book to add to your collection at this time. Yeah, this is a book I have picked up in dollar boxes every single time I see it, um, because I think that new comic book collectors, new speculators, new investors, new resellers, new flippers, new retailers, they cannot appreciate the phenomenon that this book was on a kind of a uh, mainstream media um, sort of landscape. To, to kind of give you an idea, this is the first gay wedding in comics. Uh, North Star, uh, the leader, the, the um, kind of main character of the Alpha Flight, uh, gets married in this issue. This made headlines all over the place. It, it was, was like every daytime television show was a talking points. Exactly, exactly. It was everywhere. And because of that, this was certainly a, a well-ordered issue. It was heavily ordered. Um, so it was one of those flash-in-the-pan event issues, right, where it's like a $10, $15 back issue for a while. And then um, when people are not talking about it on The View or USA Today or um, uh, on you know Good Morning America, then it, it's no longer the book of the moment. But we just talked about Alpha Flight. And this scene, um, this moment is kind of ready to be shown on the big screen, the small screen. Um, I think if they go deep into Alpha Flight, they will definitely delve into North Star. I think he's one of the most marketable factors within Alpha Flight. We've talked about Apollo and Midnighter. Uh, representation matters. We've certainly seen the success that say female representation on the big screen within the superhero universe has had. We've certainly seen this success that uh, people of color and their representation within these superhero universes have had. I think it's only a matter of time before the LGBTQ community um, is represented and represented in the light in which they deserve. And I think that North Star and Alpha Flight could be kind of the perfect conduit for that. And there is no better vehicle than the MCU or the Disney Plus streaming service to be able to do that and to do that in a manner that's you know tasteful and family friendly. And uh, I think that this issue is one that could see its light of day. Again, it's got a beautiful wraparound cover. There's also a very unique blank cover where only a small portion of the cover is actually blank for sketches. And it sets a frame um, that's supposed to be like a wedding album type cover. And you know, Brian and I, we run a great website, exclusivevariants.com. We love to talk about exclusive variants. There's actually an exclusive variant for this book from the Heroes Convention way back when, when they did this, which is my LCS, Heroes Aren't Hard to Find. And that exclusive variant, actually, instead of the blank section, uh, features 
a, a image of the owner of Heroes Aren't Hard to Find, Sheldon Drum and his wife. He made that exclusive variant as a present for his wife. So all of you men out there, step your game up. Have you made an exclusive variant for your significant other yet? But that book is another book that I think will be the lowest printed uh, copy of this book. So if it takes off, that could be one to be on the lookout for. I'm making an exclusive variant for my wife, but I'm better off just throwing the money in the toilet because she would be like, what's this, a stupid comic book? <laughs> right. So there it is, guys. There's our top 10 back issues for this week. As we always say, we do a top 10 each week, but it all combines to one master list. We have volume one of over 100 back issues to be on the lookout for, available right now on our website, simplemanscomics.com. Fabulous ebook, $1.95, less than $2.00. And the past few videos, plus the upcoming ones, will be forming to make volume two, right? That's right. And it's on the way. It will hit this summer. Um, so stay tuned and be on the lookout for volume two coming soon. With that being said, guys, this is Brian Jack with Superman's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video. Yeah, no, I'm studying like a milli rocket. Skin clear, still look y'all. Andy Miller knocking money in my pocket. Don't call me a money pocket. Engine get to rocket. It sound like a thunder rocket. Yeah, I still love my baby even when it's toxic. Crazy like she Britney, but no, she don't shade the knock.